Hello, everyone, and welcome to Lecture 11 of uh, GPU Computing. And today we're going to start talking about new parallel pattern, which is scan. And in particular, we're going to look at a specific approach to parallel scan, which is the Koji Stone algorithm. And next time, we'll actually look at a different approach uh, for doing parallel scan. But before we start, um, just a quick review of what we covered last time. Last time, we looked at reduction. Uh, we said that the reduction is an operation that takes a set of input values and reduces them into one value by some kind of operator, uh, such as some product minimax. In general, this operator, this operation should be associative, commutative, and have some kind of identity value. And we used some as an example, uh, but uh, the, the, the same thing, the same uh, thing that we learned uh, applies to the other operators like product, minimum, or maximum. Uh, a sequential reduction for sum would look like this. You would initialize the sum to sum uh, to zero, and then you would loop over the elements of the input array, and you would accumulate them to the sum accumulator. Uh, in general, uh, if you were doing uh, if you're doing a reduction, uh, you would initialize the acu sum accumulator to the identity value, and then you would loop at, over the inputs uh, elements in the array, and you'd apply the operation to the accumulator and the input value, and put the result in the accumulator. So, for example, if this was max, the identity would be the uh, the absolute minimum. Uh, and then the accumul the f over here would be the max operation. Uh, we then looked at how to parallelize this, and we said that one way we can parallelize it is by uh, you know if we have a certain set of inputs, we have uh, you know we have half the number of uh, we have half the half the num half the number of inputs and threads, and every thread is responsible for adding two elements, uh, and that reduces the number of input values we have in two. Uh, and then we have uh, uh, a number of threads uh, to oh, again add uh, add uh, two elements in par each thread adds two elements all in parallel. And then we have half the number of elements again, and we keep doing this until we have uh, the final result. Uh, and we saw how the, we call this a reduction tree. Uh, and what we can do is we can add n elements in log n steps uh, in parallel. Uh, but we saw that uh, we need to have a global a, a synchronization across threads on every iteration. Because the threads need uh, the threads need to wait for each other to finish. Because in the next iteration, one thread is going to have to use the result of multiple previous threads. Uh, and because uh, this operation requires this kind of synchronization, we usually solve it in a segmented way, where we take the input, we segment it. Every thread block does a reduction tree locally, uh, and then they store the partial sums somewhere. And then we go and reduce these partial sums either uh, by having a new reduction kernel that that. Uh, 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 that reduces these partial sums, or using atomic operations, which we will cover later, or by adding them on the CPU. And the reason we do this is because we can't have global synchronization across different thread blocks, so we can't just have one big reduction tree across the entire GPU. We looked at different ways of doing a reduction tree within a thread block. Uh, the first, uh, um, and you know, perhaps the most intuitive way of doing it is like this: we had a thread for assigned to every other element, and th and th this thread first would add the element that. Uh, these threads would add the elements that were one away from each other, and then e e every other thread would add elements that are two away from each other, and then we keep going until we have one final result. But we observed that this approach is not actually very, is not very good for uh, for memory coalescing and control divergence because every time we have every other thread dropping out, uh, and also uh, when the threads are accessing data, they're accessing it in a strided way. So what we did is rearranged how the threads are accessing the data in order for us to uh, first uh, minim uh, minimize the control divergence, and then second also have uh, coalesced memory access piece. So here, when these threads access their all access their first element, these first elements are all next to each other, and then when these threads all access the second element, these second elements are all next to each other. Uh, we then saw that we repeatedly reuse the same memory location. So what we did is we Put, uh, we use uh, after after the first initial load from global memory, we continue with doing the reduction tree in shared memory. Uh, and we also saw that doing uh, reduction in parallel actually has this overhead of doing a sync global of doing uh, a block wide synchronization and also of this control divergence that we have towards the end of the reduction tree. Uh, so what we did to minimize that price of parallelization uh, is applied thread coarsening. So if the hardware was going to serialize our thread blocks anyways, we could just have one thread block of multiple thread blocks uh, where the, the thread block would initially uh, do a sequential reduction across the, the thread blocks until it has enough elements uh, for, uh, 
uh, for one element for each thread, and then it would continue doing the reduction tree in shared memory. And the advantage of this is that this initial phase uh, where the block loops over, uh, goes through more elements, uh, this initial phase does not require synchronization across threads, and it also does not require you to, uh, to uh, we, the intermediate results can be placed in register. Uh, and here we analyze the benefits of coarsening. We saw that if the blocks are all going to get executed in parallel, uh, then we need log n steps, uh, and each step needs a synchronization, so we need log n synchronizations. Uh, but if the if the hardware was going to serialize my blocks by a factor of c, uh, then the then the the execution time is going to be around c times log n steps, and I'm going to need c uh, times log n synchronizations on the critical path of the execution. Uh, and the reason is that each each thread block needs log n steps and log n synchronizations, uh, and uh, and uh, we're gonna we're we're executing thread blocks one after the other. Uh, on the other hand, if we coarsen the uh, the thread blocks, uh, then rather than having log n steps and log n synchronizations, uh, we're gonna have an initial phase where we do a sequential accumulation without uh, uh, without any synchronization, and that's gonna require two times c minus one steps. Uh, and then at the very end, we're going to have log n steps and log n synchronization. So you'll notice that coarsening reduces the number of synchronizations that I need to make and also reduces the number of steps uh, that I need to take. Uh, so this was a quick overview of what we covered last time. Any questions before we move on to talking about scan today? Okay. Uh, well, then today we're going to talk about scan. Uh, in particular, we'll look at the Koji Stone method. Uh, uh, for doing parallel scan, and next time we'll look at a different method. And we're also going to cover an optimization we haven't seen before, which is double buffering. So let me start uh, by introducing what scan is. So a scan operation uh, is an operation that takes uh, an input array. So this is where it can be x0 to xn minus 1, uh, and an associative operator. Uh, and this associative operator could be anything. It could be sum, product, minimum, maximum. Uh, and what the scan operation does is that it returns uh, an output array y0 to y n minus 1. Uh, and there's two versions of scan, uh, inclusive and exclusive. An inclusive scan, uh, every uh, element in this y array is going to be uh, the combination of all the elements uh, in the x array up to that, uh, up, up to the same index. Uh, so for example, yi is going to be uh, x0 up until xi all combined with each other using uh, this, uh, this associative operator. Uh, an exclusive scan, an exclusive scan, every element in Y, so YI is going to be the combination of all the preceding elements, but not including uh, I. So here, YI is going to be the combination of X0 to XI minus 1, but not including XI, whereas inclusive scan includes XI. So let me uh, show you an example of what I mean by this. Uh, uh, we'll start with addition. Uh, so an inclusive scan in the context of addition looks like this. Uh, the first, uh, I have an array that has three of these values over here. The first element in the result output array is going to be uh, just the, the corresponding to the element of the input array. The second element is going to be the sum of the first and the second element. The third element uh, here, 16, is going to be the sum of 3, 6, and 7. Uh, the fourth element, 20, is going to be the sum of 3, 6, 7, and 4, etc. Okay, on the other hand, with exclusive scan, in the output array, the first element is going to be zero. Uh, the second element is going to be the sum of the preceding elements, but not including the corresponding elements. So it's going to be the sum of just three. Uh, nine here is going to be three plus six, but we don't include seven. Uh, 16 will be three plus six plus seven. 20 will be three plus six plus seven plus four, etc. So every element is going to be the sum of all the preceding elements, but not the corresponding elements. This is what exclusive scan is. Uh, in general, uh, if we have an array x0 to x7, then an inclusive scan, every element is going to be the combination of all the preceding elements uh, and the corresponding element. So in this case, uh, this value will be x0 to x3. Uh, and an exclusive scan, every, the initial value will be the, ident the identity value. And then every element will be the sum of all the preceding elements, not including the, 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 uh, the corresponding elements. So here, uh, the value of y3 is going to be x0 to x2. So it's x0 to x2, but not including x3. Okay, uh, so this is what the scan operation is. 
Uh, as you can see, it's actually quite a sequential operation, but there are actually good ways to parallelize it. Let's look first at how we do a, a scan sequentially. So a sequential scan for some is going to look like this. Uh, in the inclusive scan case, the uh, output of zero is going to be input of zero. All right, and then we're going to loop over the elements from one to n, and then output of i is going to be output of i minus one plus input of i. Okay, so in other words, output of one is going to be output of zero uh, plus uh, uh, plus input of one. Output of two is going to be output of one plus input of two, etc. Uh, with exclusive scan, we're going to uh, initialize the output uh, to zero, uh, and then we're going to do output of i is equal to output of i minus one plus input of i minus one as opposed to input of i over here, okay? And uh, in general, uh, this is what the inclusive scan and the exclusive scan look like. Uh, again, here, instead of zero, we have the identity value. And instead of addition over here, we just have whatever operator uh, we, are, uh, we, are, we are using to define our scan operation, okay? Uh, is it clear what scan does to everyone? Anybody have any questions? Okay, um, so similar to reduction, uh, when we do scan in parallel, we're gonna have to synchronize across threads. And because we need to synchronize across threads, uh, we can't do a global scan across the entire GPU. So what we do is we typically do a segmented scan. So similar to reduction, threads must synchronize to perform scan and we cannot synchronize across thread locks. So the solution is to do use a segmented scan. The textbook also refers to this as a hierarchical scan. Uh, where every thread block scans a segment, uh, and then we scan the partial sums, and then we update the segments based on the partial sums. So this is what it looks like. If we have some input, uh, every block is going to take a segment of this input, and it's going to perform a scan on the segment. So every block has a scanned version of the array. Uh, and then every block is going to store a partial sum, which is going to be the sum of all the elements uh, in, the, in their segment into some array. Okay, uh, and then what we will do is we will scan these partial sums. Okay, so here each 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 uh, sum over here corresponds to the sum of the blocks. So what we do is we scan the partial sum. So now uh, this element corresponds to uh, the sum uh, of all the elements in block zero. This element corresponds to the partial sum of block zero and block one. In other words, it corresponds to all the sum of all the elements in block zero and block one. Uh, this element here corresponds to the scan of the partial sums, uh, so it's the, of block 0, 1, and 2. In other words, it's going to be the sum of all the elements in block 0, 1, and 2, uh, et cetera. Uh, and then what we do is we have to go back. So here to block 1, we need to add the sum of all the elements in block 0, which is uh, this value over here. In block 2, we need to add the sum of all the elements in block 0 and block 1, so which is going to be this element over here, et cetera. So what we do is we take these scanned partial sums uh, and then we add them back to, uh, to, to all the elements in each of the blocks uh, results so that we have the final scanned array, okay? So we do a local scan uh, and then we produce a partial sum for each block. We scan the partial sums and then each block takes the partial sum of the previous blocks and adds it to its own element. Notice here how block zero is not gonna add anything because block zero doesn't have any blocks before it. But here, block one is going to add the partial sum uh, that, that correspond this partial sum here, which corresponds to the block zero value. Uh, block two is going to add this partial sum, et cetera. Okay. So now we know how to segment scan and do it in different blocks in parallel. So what remains is how to implement a parallel sum in each block. And this is what we'll be talking about for the rest of today. But before I move on, uh, is the idea of a segmented scan clear to everyone? Someone's asking if this one is inclusive. Uh, yes, you can think of this as being inclusive. Actually, over here, I intentionally did not draw an arrow from a specific element to a specific block because I wanted this figure to be general enough to, uh, um, to, uh, to work for inclusive and exclusive. Uh, but yes, the, the, whether it's inclusive or exclusive, uh, will impact uh, what uh, what element we're going to use when we uh, when we look, when we access this partial sum array to accumulate the final result of these blocks in the second group. Okay. 
uh, professor, we could implement this recursively if it was like a CPU to to have good performance, but on GPU that wouldn't work. Uh, so what we what we usually do is we uh, we, we we can do the recursion. Uh, so here these thread blocks uh, when they store their partial sums, they all need to wait for these partial sums to uh, to be scanned before they can before they can accumulate their partial sums to their elements. So here, these thread blocks are not, uh, we're not going to do the recursion on the GPU, okay? So these thread blocks are going to go away because the only way we can synchronize across all the thread blocks is by, by terminating the kernel and launching a new one. Uh, so here, uh, what's, what, what can be done is we have a, a grid that, uh, that does these local scans and produces these partial sums array. But then when to scan this array, we can recursively call the sub function on the CPU uh, so that we perform a scan for this array on the GPU. Okay, so this is how we can uh, we can use recursion to do. Uh, so yes, we, we we can use the recursion, but as you said, uh, um, we're not going to do it on the GPU. Instead, we will do the recursion on this uh, with the stub function. I see. Okay, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Okay, so having said this, uh, let's proceed and see how we can do a parallel scan inside of each thread block. Uh, and the algorithm we're going to use is called the Koji Stone uh, parallel uh, the algorithm. And in particular, we're going to use the inclusive scan first. So we're going to start with inclusive scan. And the way the Koji Stone uh, algorithm works for doing a parallel scan is as follows. Uh, I'm going to start off with this array x0, x1, x2 to x7. I'm going to assign a thread to each one of these values. Okay. And then in the first iteration, what's going to happen is every thread is going to add the element it owns to the uh, previous element, the element that's one to the left, okay? So at the end of this iteration, you'll notice, that obviously for x0, there's no element to the left, so we won't do anything with x0. But here for x1, now we have x0 to x1, so this value is complete. For x2, we have x1 to x2, okay? So it's not, it's not complete yet. But now each value is going to be, consist of itself uh, and uh, the pre the value to itself. Well, now what we observe is that here x1 to x2, uh, here I need to have x0 to x2, so I'm still missing x0. Over here of x2 to x3, I still need to have x0 and x1, so I'm still missing x0 and x1, right? Uh, uh, and here x3, x4 needs more than that. It needs more than just two elements. Uh, but what we can do next, if we just want to complete these two elements, is we can have every thread, rather than adding the element that's one to its left, it adds the element that is two to its left. So here, every thread is going to now add uh, the element that's two to the left. So here to x1 and x2, this thread that owns x1 and x2 is going to add uh, x0. The thread that owns x2 to x3 is going to add x0 to x1 so that we get x0 to x3. And now we have these first four elements are complete, and we have these remaining four elements are incomplete. Okay, but all the threads are going to add the element that's two to the left. Okay, now in the next iteration, uh, what we will do, well, we observe here that x, this partial sum, x1 to x4, just needs x0 so that we can have the final, the x0 to x4. So we, all we need is x0. This partial sum here, x2 to x5, it just needs x0 and x1, which is over here. Uh, this over here, x3 to x6, it only needs, uh, it, it needs x0 to x2, which is over here, et cetera. So what we can do finally is that every element is going to add the value that is 4 to its left, okay, uh, to get the, the, uh, the next result. And you'll notice that uh, with three iterations, we are done performing the scan. Okay? So we have an array of eight elements, and we were able to perform the scan in parallel using three steps, which is log eight. Okay. So with log n steps, we were able to uh, perform the uh, scan in parallel. Any questions about this approach? Is it clear to everyone? So basically, all the threads work. In the first step, each thread uh, each thread uh, act, uh, adds the element that's one to its left. In the second step, each thread adds the element that's two to its left. In the, in the third step, each uh, step each thread adds the element that's four to it. Clear? Okay. Well, if everything's clear, let's go and implement. 
So over here, uh, I started us off with uh, some code. Uh, here, uh, what the scan, uh, uh, what the scan does is that uh, uh, we all allocate the partial sums. So here, the CPU is taking care of the segmented scan stuff. So here, I allocate the partial sums. I call the scan kernel, and then you'll notice here if I have one thread block, that means I'm done. Uh, so I just do the addition. If I have uh, if I sorry, if I have more than one thread block, then I recall I call the sub function recursively until I'm down to one thread block. And once I'm down to one thread block, that means I'm done, and I can go back. And after I return uh, uh, from uh, from doing scanning the partial sums, I call an add kernel that's going to add the partial sums for each thread block. Okay, so this code over here is basically taking care of uh, that segmented scan that I told told you about. I have two kernels. The second add kernel is is the uh, Take care of the part where after I, I add the I scan the partial sums, uh, I go back and for each thread block I add uh, I add to it the partial sum that it needs to add to all of its elements. Uh, so what's left uh, is for me to implement this scan kernel uh, to follow this Koji stone uh, uh, parallel inclusion. Okay, so let's do that. Uh, the first is for each uh, thread to identify the input element that it's responsible. Uh, and you'll notice that unlike reduction, uh, here in scan, every thread or every element has a corresponding thread. Okay. In reduction, we had every thread, ha every other element had a thread that owned it. Uh, or in the in the coalesced version, uh, the first half of the elements had threads and the others did not. But here in scan, every element is going to have a corresponding thread. Uh, so uh, uh, finding out what element a thread is responsible for is nice and we just do unsign and i equals block in dot x times block bin dot x plus thread index dot x. Okay. So now every thread has a corresponding uh, element that is responsible for in the input. Uh, what I'm going to do first is I'm going to move, I don't want to modify my input. You'll notice here I'm modifying the values in place. I don't want to modify my input array. So what I'm going to do for starters is I'm just going to move all the input values to the output array, and then I'm going to work inside of the output array. Okay, so I'm going to just write uh, output of i uh, is equal to input of i. Okay, so I'm going to move uh, all my input elements to my output array so that later on I perform this scan in my output array. Okay, uh, and I'm also going to sync threads here. Uh, because uh, you know this this thread is moving uh, is x one from the input array to the output array, uh, but then this thread and this thread both need to access x one in the first iteration. Uh, so I need to sync threads to make sure that this thread finishes moving x one from the input array to the output array before this thread tries to access it from the output array. Okay, uh, so I have a sync thread. So now I can begin my loop that does the reduction. Uh, and I'll notice, just like with reduction, where the stride was a convenient uh, uh, index to use for the loop, uh, we're also going to use the stride here as the index of the loop. Uh, so you'll notice in the first step, the stride was 1. In the second step, the stride was 2. In the third step, the stride was 4. Okay, so, uh, so basically, the stride is going to start at 1, and we're going to multiply it by 2 every time. So I'm going to have a loop that, go that goes from... from uh, Unsigned int stride equals equals one stride. Uh, where does stride end? Well, let's take a look here. Every thread block has eight elements, and we go with a stride of one, two, and then four. We stop at four uh, because by 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 the time we get to four, all the threads have the results ready, and obviously we can't have a stride of eight because uh, for any of these threads, a stride of eight is just going to take out of bounds. Okay, so we so the for a threat for a th uh, for eight elements we need we stop at a stride of four. In general, for block dim elements, uh, we're gonna stop at a stride of block dim over two. Okay, so we're gonna have stride less than or equal to block dim over two, uh, and we are gonna multiply stride by two uh, on every iteration. Doctor. Yes. Why don't we put the output elements in the shared memory? Well, we will. Uh, well that, that's that's a very good observation. So it is a good idea to put the output elements in the shared memory. 
Uh, but because, for pedagogical reasons, we're doing things one step at a time. So you're absolutely right. Uh, it's a great optimization to put the output elements in shared memory. Uh, and uh, in order for me to kind of take things one step at a time and also to show you what is the incremental improvement of putting things in shared memory, I'm starting by working in global memory. And then the first thing we're going to do is we're going to put it in shared memory. Okay. So, but yeah, that's a great observation that we should put uh, put it in shared memory. Okay. Uh, so, uh, after we've, uh, now we have this loop that goes through, uh, our, uh, our stride. Now, what are we going to do on every iteration? Well, let's take a look on every iteration. What we will do is we're going to add the element that is stride to the left. Okay. So in other words, we're going to do output of I as plus equals output of I minus stride. Okay. Output of i equals output of i minus stride. So for each element, we're going to add to it the element that is stride to its left. Here we add the element that's one to the left. Here we add the element that's two to the left. And then here we're adding the element that's four to the left. Okay. But you'll notice that not all the threads compute on every iteration. Only the threads, uh, only the threads uh, that whose. Uh, so here, uh, when the stride is one, only threads one. To seven compute. When the stride is two, only threads two to seven compute. When the stride is four, only threads four to seven compute. Okay, so in general, for any value of stride, the threads that compute are the threads that go are going to be whose index is going to be greater than or equal to the stride. Okay, uh, so we need to have a boundary check over here where we write if, uh, and again, uh, we're doing this on a per thread block basis. So here, the index that we're going to compare is the local index of the thread block, not the global index. So here, we're going to check if thread index dot x uh, is greater than or equal to stride. Then we're going to do output of i plus equals output of i minus stride. Okay. We also need one to not go out of bounds, right? Uh, you uh, well that 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 we can uh I, I, in this uh in this uh I'm not worried about if you mean out of bounds at the very end of the of the input uh, in general in these lectures you've noticed that I haven't been worrying about uh, uh the out of the bounds at the end uh, when I'm implementing the code just because I like to leave something for you to uh, do in the assignment so yes we would need to have a check for when we uh, when the very last elements are out of bounds, but that is something that you can do uh, as an exercise in the assignment, uh, and we are kind of intentionally not uh, covering that uh, in the lecture. Okay. Uh, okay. So, uh, so we do this. Uh, uh, what now? One thing to note is that uh, on each of these iterations, right? Every the, we need to wait for all the threads to finish writing their updated values. Before proceeding to the next iteration, where the new threads start, the threads start reading the new values. So how do we how do we get all threads to wait for each other on each uh, iteration? What do we use? Go well, on, guys. How do threads write? Sync threads, right? So we're we're gonna have to use as on every iteration. We're going to need a sync thread uh, to make sure that the threads wait for each other before they put. Okay, and then, uh, and then uh, we'll, we'll, what we need to do once we are done uh, is that the last thread is going to have the sum for all the elements of the thread block. So this last thread is going to need to take this result and store it in the partial sums array so that the, so that when we do a scan of the partial sum array, that value is there. So how do I check if something is the last thread? I'm going to do if thread index dot x uh, is equal to uh, uh, block dim. I could have wrote block dim dot x dot as well, block dim minus one. Okay. And if thread index dot x is equal to block dim minus one, uh, then what I'm going to do is I need to take the partial sum of the thread of the last thread. I'm going to store it uh, as the partial sum for the entire block. So I'm going to write partial sums of 
log index dot x. So the partial sum for this block is going to be equal to the uh, the value that is owned, the output value that is owned by this thread. So it's going to be to out output of i. Okay. Is this clear to everyone? Any questions? Okay, so then uh, let's now compile this and let's run it. Okay. Okay, let's run it again. Oh. Okay, so somehow this actually worked, but it was actually it was not supposed to work. So uh, maybe maybe we just got low. Um, and this worked. Okay, so somehow we got lucky and this worked. Um, uh, but not supposed to work, actually. This was not supposed to work. Uh, and there's a reason why uh, this was not supposed to work. Um, and the reason is uh, that uh, over here, when I read output of i minus stride and I add it to output of i, uh, I actually have a race condition. Okay, so this uh, is incorrect. It's odd because I actually tested right before the class uh, and this did not work. So I'm, I wonder why it actually does work. Uh, um, it did work now. Uh, anyways, uh, sometimes that's the thing about race conditions. Sometimes they happen and sometimes they don't. So, but if you run for enough times, eventually uh, you might get into the situation where, uh, where, where the, uh, the code won't work. Let me show you why uh, the co this code that we wrote does not, does not work. So you'll notice over here, uh, I, let's focus on what these two threads are doing. So this, this thread over here reads x1 and it reads x0 and it writes x0, x1 in, in, in the output. So here, both of these are the same array, okay? Uh, whereas this thread, over, this thread over here is gonna read x1 and read x2 and store the result from x1 to x2, okay? Now, what's the problem here? The problem is that if we if we write our code like this, where I do, just do output of i plus equals output of i minus stride, uh, if thread if this thread over here thread one reads x zero and x one and then writes the result of the addition x zero to x one before this thread over here reads x one, then we have a problem. Okay. Uh, and the problem is that if this thread reads x0 and x1 and then stores x0 to x1 in its place, when this thread comes to do the reading, it's actually going to read x0 to x1. It's not going to read x1. Okay? So what we need to do is we need to read, we need to make sure that this thread, thread 2, reads x1 before we allow thread 1 to write the updated value of x1. Okay? We need to make sure that thread two reads x1 before we allow thread one to update x1. Okay, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna read it, we're gonna sync, and then we're gonna write, and then we're gonna sync. Okay, so here we need to make sure that every thread is gonna read output of i minus stride before we allow the the, the thread that owns output of i minus, minus stride to update it when, it when we do output of i plus equals the result, okay? So we're gonna separate the statement in two. We're going to create a temporary variable, let's call it v, okay? We're gonna read output of i minus stride, okay? We're gonna take threads, Okay, and then we're going to update output of i by adding to it the old value of output of i minus stride. Now we have a problem here, and the problem is that I cannot have sync threads inside of this if condition. Why can't I have the sync threads inside of this if condition? Because some threads that won't go in would synchronize with the later sync thread, so it's going to mess everything up. Right, so some thread, not all the threads are going to take uh, this if condition. 
Uh, and whenever I have sync threads, I need to make sure that all of the threads can actually reach the sync thread. So actually, what, what's not what it's not going to be the case that some threads will reach this one and some threads will reach this one and they'll sync. Uh, that's not the way CUDA works. In CUDA, every sync thread is its own barrier. So different threads reaching different sync threads doesn't mean they will sync together. Okay. So in this case, uh, if you put a sync threads in a place where you have control divergence, we're not. If you put a sync threads in a place where not all the threads in the block are guaranteed to reach. Uh, be, you'll actually just have undefined behavior, and what that means is that the compiler gives you no guarantees that it will produce correct results for your program. Okay. So what we need to do is we need to actually uh, put the sync the sync the sync threads outside of the boundary check. So we're gonna close the boundary check here. Uh, and then we're going to sync threads, uh, and then we're going to do the check again. Okay, uh, so we read the value, we sync threads, and then we update the value. Okay, so this actually is uh, correct. Okay, and then I'm going to compile this, uh, and I'm going to run it, uh, and uh, it produces uh, a correct result. Uh, the other one uh, luckily produced correct results, but it was not supposed to. The, the previous implementation was not correct. Okay, uh, so uh, so let, uh, you'll notice over here that uh, the the kernel, the GPU kernel, is called multiple times, and that's because uh, you remember we have this invented can, and then we are we were recursively uh, calling the kernel again to do the scan for the partial. Uh, so here we uh, uh, we did three different scans. Of course, the first scan. Uh, was the one that took the most amount of time because that's the one that had the largest array. Uh, these here were small because they were just scanning the partial sums array, which are much smaller than the original. Okay, uh, so on the CPU, it takes around 50 milliseconds. On the GPU, it took around 8.4 uh, milliseconds, uh, plus uh, all this uh, other stuff. In total, the GPU time actually took longer than the CPU time in this case. However, if your array is already on the GPU, uh, you definitely want to, you definitely, this, this time, uh, a lot of it is the copy time, right? A lot of it is copying to the GPU uh, and then copying back from the GPU. But if you eliminate the time it takes to copy to the GPU and copy back from the GPU, uh, then the, the time that it takes to do the scan on the GPU is substantially faster. So if your data is already on the GPU, uh, then you probably, you, you definitely want to do your, uh, uh, your scan on the GPU and it will be much faster than doing it on the CPU. Okay. Doctor. Uh, Doctor. Yes. Question. In in which in what cases do do we always do we have the data already on the GPU? So if I'm if I'm writing this uh, a large uh, large code for doing simulation uh, simulating something, right? What I do is at the very very beginning of my application, I I I copy the initial data to the GPU. And then I run all the different computations on the GPU. I launch many kernels to do many different operations. And then in the final result, I bring it back to the CPU. Okay. Uh, so if I if I have an operation, uh, a computation that I'm doing uh, that does many different things, and one of those things those things is scan. Okay. I'm not going to copy to the GPU, do my first operation, then bring it back. Then copy again to the GPU, do the second operation, then bring it back. And then copy to the GPU. Do the scan and then bring it back, right? I'm going to copy at the beginning. I'm going to do all, all the operations in the GPU, and then I'm going to bring back the result. Okay, so in this case, usually uh, with these long running applications, there are many, many, many kernels that run on the GPU, uh, one after the other, uh, and uh, and that's why you know the the copy time uh, is usually advertised across all the all the benefit that we're going to get for all of these kernels. Okay. But if all we're doing is just doing a scan, which is not typically the case, then yeah, maybe it's better to just do it on this. Have I answered your question? Yes, thanks. Yeah. Another example, for example, is like if you have a neural network with many layers, right? You're gonna have a kernel that executes each layer, right? But you don't need to uh, copy, you know, the, the output of one layer is the input to the other layer, so you just keep that on the GPU. There's no point in copying back the output of the layer to the CPU and then copying it back to the GPU as the input of the next layer and running the kernel for the next layer, right? You just keep the, the output of the previous layer on the GPU as the input to the next layer.
Uh, somebody was asking if I could repeat the issue with sinking inside the essay. Yeah. Uh, so here, if I did not have the if statement, if I did not have the if statement, I just had this. The problem is that not all the threads in the block uh, are going to come inside of this if statement. So not all the threads in the block are going to reach the sync threads. However, sync threads requires that all the threads in the block reach it. And that is why if I put sync threads inside of an if statement like this, I'm going to have undefined behavior. Is that clear? Professor? Uh, but wouldn't the threads that, uh, that don't go into the if be already like uh, inactive and not doing anything? Uh, right, and that's a problem because sync threads means that all the threads in the block need to reach it. So if some of those threads are inactive, they're not going to reach the sync thread. Okay, but you know that that that's not necessarily that's not necessarily you know what uh, what actually happens. Uh, the semantics of sync threads are that uh, all the, it, uh, wherever you have a sync threads, all the threads in the block need to be able to reach that sync thread. If you if you uh, if you put a sync thread in a place where not all the threads in the block can reach it, uh, then this will result in undefined behavior. Okay? Because the compiler might make the assumption that all threads can reach that sync threads and and uh, and that will impact how the compiler will generate uh, code. Okay? So you should always uh, put a sync threads in a place where all threads and block can reach it. Otherwise, there's no guarantee that the compiler will give you correct code. Hi, professor, but like, Thank if, if we're not, if the thread, the sync threads are not confused in between each other, do they have some sort of ID number or like some sort of number? That, that so, so that you know that that is that would be kind of base, that would be that's uh, related to the hardware implementation and how the hardware implements sync threads. So there's going to be some kind of resource that is needed uh, to support uh, being able to do a synchronization, right? And maybe each of these sync threads is going to uh, have its own resource or not, right? But the, the point is that uh, each sync thread is its own barrier. Uh, and if you if you, this sync thread is different from this one, if some threads reach this one and some threads reach this one, that doesn't mean they're syncing together, okay? It's different for, from you know other uh, other uh, parallel programming modes, for example, like MPI, where if you do a if you do a synchronization, different different uh, ranks uh, reaching different MPI calls might be able to synchronize together from different calls. That's not the case in CUDA. In CUDA, only threads uh, threads synchronize with each other on the via the same call, not via different. Calls. I see. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Okay, let's go back to our correct code. Okay, so having said that, uh, let's now, uh, uh, so we said our solution is to wait uh, for uh, everybody to uh, read before we do any writes. Uh, and this is what we did, and we saw that this gave us correct code. Uh, so this is great. Now we have a uh, kernel that does scan. So now let's look at how we can optimize this kernel. And as one of you said, one of the first things that comes to mind is what we did with reduction, and that is to use shared memory. You'll notice here that the memory locations are reused. Uh, so rather than uh, doing all of this inside of global memory, what we can do is we can uh, in the first and load the initial values into shared memory, and then do our scan in shared memory, and then store the final results to global memory. Uh, and, and we can do that, and let's see uh, what performance benefit that gives us. So here, uh, rather than loading from the input to the output, okay, we can load from the input to a shared memory buffer, and then we can do all of this inside of the shared memory buffer, and then we can store to the output uh, at the very end. Okay, so let's uh, write the code that does that. So I'm gonna start by uh, creating a shared memory buffer. 
I'm just going to call it buffer underscore s. Uh, how big is this buffer going to be? Uh, well, uh, remember that uh, the number of elements that a thread block owns corresponds to the number of threads in the block. Okay, so we're just going to have block dim elements. Okay, uh, next, what we do instead of loading uh, to the output, instead of loading input of i to output of i, we're going to load to the buffer itself. Okay, so we're going to load to the buffer. And of course, when we load to the buffer, we're not going to use the global index of the thread uh, to access the shared memory buffer. We're going to use the local index of the thread to access the shared memory buffer. Okay. So now that we've uh, done this, now all the places where we were accessing the uh, uh, global array, global output array, we should go and we should uh, use uh, the uh, the uh, uh, the buffer instead. So here, instead of output, we're going to have buffer underscore s, and instead of i, we're going to use thread index.x. By the way, this now should make this boundary condition much more clear, right? So here, uh, I'm, I'm accessing my shared memory buffer with thread index.x minus drive, which means that thread index.x minus drive should be greater than or equal to zero, which means that thread index.x should be greater than or equal to drive. Okay. Uh, and then over here, I'm going to use buffer underscore s, and I'm going to index it with thread index thread index dot x. Uh, and then down here, I will also use buffer underscore s, and I will index it with thread index dot x. Okay, and then of course, uh, finally, I do need to eventually write to my output array. So I will also write output of i, uh, is equal to buffer underscore s of thread index dot x. Okay. Uh, and with this, what we've done is we have changed our code so that we use a shared memory buffer throughout the computation. Uh, and then at the end, we write to uh, we, we write uh, to the output. Okay. Is this clear to everyone? Any questions? Okay, let's run this code. Remember before, it took us about 8.4 milliseconds to do the, the largest scan kernel. So now let's compile and let's see what uh, performance improvement using shared memory has given us. So now we're down to 6.4 milliseconds from 8.4 milliseconds. So that's around a 25% improvement, uh, which is quite nice. Okay, uh, let's can improve this further. Uh, uh, so this is the shared memory code that we wrote. Uh, now, one observation uh, is that uh, every loop iteration, we've had to use sync thread twice, which is different from reduction, where we used it once per iteration. And remember, what was the reason we're using sync thread twice? Well, the reason was that we need to read uh, and make sure everybody reads before we let anybody write. Well, one optimization to avoid syncing twice is by uh, is, is by using two different buffers. Uh, one and having a the problem here, the main problem, is that I'm using the same buffer as both an input and an output. Okay. Uh, so what we can do is, if we want to eliminate the synchronization, is to use a different buffer for both the input and the output. And let me show you what that uh, would look like. Uh, so the optimi this optimization I'm about to introduce is called double buffering. And the idea of the optimization is to eliminate one of the synchronizations by using two buffers and then alternating between them. So on each iteration, we swap what the input and the output are. So on the first iteration, what we're going to do is we're going to read from one of the buffers, but we're going to write to a, the, another buffer. Okay. So in this case, uh, the input is going to be, uh, so I'm going to have two buffers, buffer one and buffer two. Uh, and in this step, the input is going to be buffer one and the output is going to be buffer two. Now, one thing you notice here is that later on, I'm going to need x zero. Uh, and here, buffer two doesn't have x zero. Uh, so what I will need to do uh, when I use two buffers is I will need this thread that was previously inactive will actually have to participate and it will have to uh, just 
trans, uh, trans, uh, transfer x0 from buffer 1 to buffer 2 without doing any addition. Now, on the second iteration, buffer 2 is going to become my input, uh, and buffer 1 is going to become my output, and I will again uh, read from my input and store to my output, okay? And because uh, I'm using a different buffer from the input and the output, I don't have to worry about, uh, you know, over here, I do not have to, this, I don't have to worry about this thread writing to x1 before this thread read from it, because this thread wasn't writing to buffer one, it was writing to buffer two. Similarly over here, I don't have to worry about, uh, I don't have to worry about, uh, you know, the, uh, this thread over here writing uh, to uh, this, this, writing to this location before this thread read from it, because this thread is not gonna write to this location, it's gonna write to the to buffer, okay? So we're gonna read from buffer two, we're gonna write to buffer one, uh, and then the threads uh, that are inactive, uh, we still need to make sure that we have these results in our buffer. So the threads that were previously inactive are just going to transfer uh, the value as is to buffer. And we also do the same thing at the end, at the end, uh, buffer one is going to be our input, buffer two is gonna become our output, and we're gonna read from buffer one and we're going to write to buffer two. Uh, and then the threads that don't do any addition are just gonna have to transfer the value from buffer one to buffer two, okay? So by doing this, what we do is we alternate the, the input buffer and the output buffer every time so that we're never reading and writing from the same place at the same time. And what that does is that it eliminates this uh, the need for me to have to synchronize between the reading and the writing. Is this clear? Is it clear why using two buffers eliminates the need to synchronize between reading and writing? Any questions about this? Okay. Well, if it's clear, uh, let's uh, go and implement this and see what performance improvement it gives. Uh, so I'm going to switch to the terminal. So here, rather than having one buffer, okay, rather than having this one buffer, okay, instead I'm going to have two buffers. I'm going to have a buffer one and a buffer two. Uh, and uh, I, I, at, at each time, one of them is going to be my input buffer and one of them is going to be my output buffer. So to make things easy for myself, I'm going to create an, a pointer. I'm going to call it in buffer, uh, and I'm going to initialize it to buffer one. Okay, so now in buffer points to buffer one. Uh, and I'm going to create another pointer. I'm going to call it out buffer, uh, and I'm going to initialize that to buffer two. Okay, so now in buffer is going to point to buffer one, and out buffer is going to point to buffer two. Let's start here initially. Uh, the end buffer was buffer one and the out buffer was buffer two. Uh, after that, I'm going to put my result, uh, my, I'm going to load my input initially to the input buffer. So here I'm going to use end buffer. Okay. Then down here, okay, instead of doing all of this, okay, all I need to do is to load from the input buffer and add and then store to the output buffer. So here, remember, our condition was if thread index.x is greater than or equal to stride, okay, then the result in the output buffer is going to be the result in the input buffer plus the result in the input buffer minus stride, okay? So here, out buffer underscore s of thread index.x, okay, is equal to in buffer underscore s of thread index.x plus in buffer underscore s of thread index.x minus stride. Okay, so I, I, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put in the output buffer the sum of the element, the corresponding element to the input buffer, and the element uh, at thread index.x minus stride. This is what I'm doing over here. Okay. But there's something important that I also need to do. What is that? Let's transfer the value as it is. Right, exactly. So here, threads that were previously not doing anything, now these threads are playing an important role. Now these threads need to take the value and transfer it as it is. So here I'm going to need to have an else. 
Okay, and in this else, I'm going to have to write output buffer is just equal to output buffer of friend index.x equals input buffer of friend index.x. Okay. And now I do a sync threads. And the nice thing here is that I only have to sync threads once. I don't have to do sync threads between the read and the write. Okay. Now I'm not done. What do I need to do after I, I do the addition? Swap pointers. Right. I need to swap the, the buffers. So now in the next iteration, uh, my end buffer is going to become buffer two, and the add buffer is going to become buffer one. So I need to swap in buffer and add buffer. So I'm going to just create a temp pointer, call it temp. I'm going to write in, I'm going to write, uh, well, I'll initialize, I'll, I'll save uh, the, the pointer, the value of in buffer, and then I'm going to write in buffer underscore s is equal to out buffer underscore s, and then out buffer underscore s is equal to 10. Okay, so now I swap the buffers. So in every iteration, I'm going to use the buffers to do the addition, and I'm going to swap them. I'm going to use the buffers, and I'm going to swap them. Okay, until I'm done. Once I'm done, I come down here, uh, and what I need to do is I need to I need to uh, now uh, store the, the total sum in the partial sums array. Okay, how do I do that? Which buffer should I use, in buffer or out buffer? In buffer. Right, I need to use in buffer. You know, even though at the very end I put the result in the out buffer, right? But the last loop iteration here actually swaps them again. So I need I should use in buffer uh, to put uh, to get the final result. Okay, and I will also use end buffer over here uh, to put the final result. Okay, so this double buffering, especially what it has done is that it saved us one sync threads inside of this loop. So now every loop iteration, rather than doing two sync threads, I'm doing one sync thread. Uh, so let's see how much performance improvement this gives us. I'm gonna compile. Uh, okay, so here I, I accidentally used the capital S. So this should be a lower case. Okay, let's compile. Uh, so remember, in last time, uh, without uh, double buffering, the, the time of the kernel was 6.4 milliseconds. Uh, so now we're going to run. Uh, and now you'll notice that our time is down to 4.4 milliseconds. Okay, so again, this is a significant performance improvement from having applied this double buffering technique. Okay, any questions about double buffering? Is it clear to everyone? So what we did is we created two different buffers instead of one. Uh, and uh, we, every time one of these buffers was the input and one of them was the output. And we swapped them on each iteration. And double buffering, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's an optimization that's used commonly in many different places uh, where you have, uh, you have you know, an input and an output, and you constantly alternate between them. Sometimes we use it to save memory because instead of uh, allocating a, a buffer for every intermediate result, uh, you just uh, continuously alternate between two buffers. But in this particular case, we used it to reduce synchronization, and we actually used more memory in order for us to reduce the synchronization. Uh, okay, so this is uh, the code that we wrote. Uh, and with that, uh, we're uh, uh, we've uh, we've done uh, taking a look at how to implement inclusive scan. What I'd like to do is just to look at how exclusive scan differs. Uh, so for for the Cogestone algorithm, exclusive scan uh, we can just formulate it as an inclusive scan, right? So uh, to do an exclusive scan, we can simply shift the elements by one when we load them to shared memory, uh, and then uh, we just uh, uh, and then we just uh, do an inclusive scan for the shifted array, okay? Uh, and then uh, the last element that we were supposed to uh, we were supposed to get that will only be used for computing the partial. Okay. So in other words, uh, to to uh, use an uh, to do an exclusive scan. Well, actually, let me first uh, do the exclusive scan on the CPU. So here for an exclusive scan of the CPU, you, rather than initializing the output of zero to input of zero, we're going to initialize output of zero 
to just zero. Okay. And rather than doing output of I equals output of I minus one plus input of I, output of I is going to be output of I minus one plus input minus one. Okay. Because in the uh, in the exclusive scan, uh, output of I does not equal, include input of I. It includes up to input of I minus one. So here I've modified the CPU code to do an, uh, an exclusive scan. Notice it's much easier than the modifications we're about to do to the GPU code. Uh, in the GPU code, the way I'm going to do an exclusive scan for the Koji Stone algorithm is I'm simply going to shift my input by one. So here, uh, it, rather than loading input of I, uh, to my buffer, I'm going to load an input of i uh, minus one. I'm going to shift my input to the right by one. Okay, so here uh, I'm going to do n buffer of input of i minus one. Okay, however, I can't do this for the very first element. For the very first element, uh, because there's no i minus one for the very first element. So for the very first element, what I will do uh, is I will load. I will just load zero. I'm going to do this on a per thread block basis. So I will write if thread index dot x equals zero. So the first thread in the block, for the first thread in the block, I'm going to load a zero. And for the remaining threads, I'm going to load the previous element. Okay. So here for the first thread in the block, I will load, I will put a zero. Uh, and for the remaining threads, I will load the previous element. Uh, and now what I have is I have a shifted array, I've taken the, the segment that the block is responsible for, and I've shifted it by one, and I've put a zero at the beginning. And now I'm just going to do what I did before. I'm going to do an inclusive scan on the shifted array, which is basically an exclusive scan on the non-shifted array. Okay. Uh, so this is, uh, yes, question? Yeah, couldn't we have loaded the whole thing shifted by one to the GPU? Uh, yes, you you could have, you could have loaded the whole thing shifted by by one as well. Uh, the, the part of the problem is that the code I've written here, is that especially the recursive code that I've written to uh, to do the partial sums, is, is kind of working for inclusive scan. Um, so that's why it uh, uh, that's why I'm doing it. Okay, because I'm trying to have as minimal changes to the inclusive scan code as possible. Uh, so uh, over here, after we do this. Uh, down here in the partial sums, uh, when we uh, add the partial sums, the partial sums should include all the elements in the block segment. Okay, but now that I've shifted by one, the last element uh, in the block segment is not going to be included in the uh, in the uh, in the in the total sum in the last element. So what I will do is uh, over here, uh, I will need to add to this input of i okay because the last thread in the block is going to load input of i minus one and the first thread in the next block is going to load zero okay so input of i is not going to be ac accounted for anywhere uh, in this code and the way i account for it is it's going to go into the partial sum uh, and i account for it by adding it here to the partial sum. all right so now that i've done this uh, every thread has done its own exclusive scan, and it has also found its partial sums and, and put it in the partial sums array. And now when I do the recursion, I'm going to do an exclusive scan on the partial sums array, okay? But if I've done an exclusive scan on the partial sums array, now when the thread block comes to add the sum of the previous blocks to its, uh, its, uh, to its elements, now the sum of the previous blocks is not going to be the sum of the previous blocks in the scanned partial sum array is not going to be here when we do the add. In the past, uh, what I was doing is I was getting, uh, when I was doing inclusive scan, I was getting the partial sum, the scan, this is the scanned partial sums of the previous thread block because I wanted to add the sum of all the previous blocks to my element. But now in exclusive scan, the sum of the uh, previous thread blocks is actually uh, at block index dot x, not in block index dot x minus one, because when I scan the partial sums array, I used an exclusive scan. So here I will also need to uh, need to remove this minus one from here in order for me to do the. Exclusive. So 
with these simple modifications, uh, we've converted our uh, our uh, uh, our uh, inclusive scan code to do an exclusive scan. Uh, and what what uh, what uh, one of you has mentioned is also uh, correct. Another way to have done it is simply to have shifted the global array by one and done an exclusive scan of the global array. So that's another uh, possible way of doing it. Okay. And then after having done this, uh, let's compile and run. Going to compile and we run uh, and see that uh, the code succeeds uh, and also has similar performance. Okay, so this is how, how we support uh, the exclusive scan. Uh, now, the final topic I'd like to talk about today is something called work efficiency. Okay, something called work efficiency. So, a parallel algorithm is said to be work efficient. If it performs the same amount of work as the corresponding sequential algorithm. Okay, so we say a parallel algorithm is work efficient if it performs the same amount of work. And by work here, I mean, uh, like, I mean the, uh, the, so in the case of scan, the number of floating point additions that we perform. Okay. So it's work efficient if it performs the same amount of work as the corresponding sequential algorithm. Okay. Now let's uh, reason about the work efficiency of scan. Okay, how many additions does the sequential scan perform? N or the less. Well, if I have to scan an array of n elements, how many uh, additions does it, does it perform? Sorry, somebody was answering. Uh, n. Right, n additions. Right. So here, if I go. Oops. So here, if I look at my sequential scan, I just have a loop uh, that's around that goes around n times, okay, and I do an addition every uh, uh, for each of these loop iterations, okay. So sequential the sequential scan performs n addition, okay. What about the Koji Stone parallel scan? How many additions does the Koji Stone parallel scan? Perform? Okay, well, let's take a look. Let's go back to our uh, uh, our illustration. So here in this illustration, we, how many steps do we have? First of all, so here are n, n the number of input elements. Here n is eight. So how many steps do I have? I have log n steps. Okay. In the first step, how many additions do I perform? I do n minus one addition, right? In the second step, I do n minus two addition. In the third step, I'm doing n minus four additions, etc. Okay. So I have log n times. So well, I have I have n minus one plus n minus two plus n minus four plus n minus two to the power of the the iteration, right? And I do that log n times. Okay, so if we go down, we go back down to uh, uh, our reasoning about our work efficiency. Uh, we're going to have log n steps, and every step we're going to do n minus two to the power of step two to the power of step operations per step. Okay, in other words, we're going to do n minus one plus n minus two plus n minus four dot 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 plus n minus n over two. Okay, and how many how many terms do I have here? I have log n terms because I have log n steps. So the final result is going to be n plus n plus n plus n log n times. So that's n log n, and then minus one plus two plus four plus dot 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 plus n over two. That comes out to n minus one. So in total, I'm going to do n times log n minus n minus one operation which is O of n log n operation. So my sequential scan performed only n additions, whereas my Koji stone parallel scan actually performed n log n additions. Okay, and what that means is that my parallel algorithm is not performing the same amount of work as my sequential algorithm. 
In other words, my parallel algorithm here is not work efficient. Uh, now, professor, isn't yes, there another, sorry, uh, isn't there another N as well for adding the partial sums later on? Uh, well, well, uh, over here, I, I what I've assumed over here is that I'm doing the uh, I'm doing the tree for the entire end. Okay. Oh, okay. I see. That makes sense. Okay. Yeah. Um, so this end here is for the entire tree, but but uh, but you know if, if you if you work it out right, it, 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 basically when you're doing the partial sums, it's like you're continuing the tree. Okay. So it, it should still be kind of similar. For uh, when when we when we did the segmented scan. Okay, so the algorithm this algorithm here is not work efficient. Okay, now if re if if all my thread blocks will actually run in parallel, okay, because remember I, even though I perform this many operations, I'm actually completing the scan in log n step. So if all my operations are going to be perfectly parallelized, if they will actually be all running in parallel, even though I'm going to perform more operations, I will do it in fewer steps, so, so I will finish faster. However, if my resources are limited, right, then the parallel algorithm might become quite slow because the parallel algorithm is actually doing more work than the sequential algorithm. It has lower work efficiency. Okay, so having made this observation, having seen that the Koji Stone algorithm has low work efficiency, okay, what we will do next time is we will look at a different parallel algorithm for scan that has better work efficiency, and we're going to compare the performance of these two algorithms. Okay, uh, so if you'd like to read more about what we talked about today, you can refer to chapter eight of the textbook. Uh, and the chapter eight of the textbook also talks about the work efficient implementation, which we will be covering next time. Any final questions about today's material? Everything clear? All right. Well, then, if there are no final questions, then that's all for today, and I'll see you next time. Bye, everyone.